You're listening to the Turn Autism Around podcast, episode number 167. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Barbera, and today I am interviewing a mom named Alyssa about her daughter, Lexi, who is just two and a half years old. This is hot seat number four. We are going to talk about uh, getting started with a new diagnosis and uh, Alyssa has read my book and now she has enrolled in my toddler course. So we talk about the differences between the book and the course. I give her some tips based on her one page assessment, one page plan and her language sample, which uh, one of the tips I've never given before, uh, not really sure why, but uh, it was full of hopefully great information for you that you can really move the needle, whether you are a parent of a child with autism or a professional. And uh, I think it's a great episode. So let's get to this interview with Alyssa. Thank you so much, Alyssa, for joining us today. I'm super excited to talk to you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So why don't we start off I don't know much about you at all. And I know our listeners know, know nothing about you. So why don't you start with your fall into the autism world? So my fall into the autism world was with my daughter. Her name is Lexi. She is two and a half now. And back in, it was April 30th, actually, that I just started to kind of put together that something wasn't quite right. She wasn't really responding to her name. She had a lot of regressions. And so at that point we were on my way to actually visit my family and we went to the zoo with my brother and he has three children and his youngest children child is six months younger than Lexi. And that was when I like really, really noticed the big differences with Lexi's lack of progress and developmental milestones. And when we got home that weekend, the next day I called the doctor and we got her into an appointment and I had made a list of all the things that I had been noticing and the milestones that she was missing. And we just started rolling right off the bat from there. And the doctor got us in to have an evaluation. It wasn't until September and at the evaluation, they did diagnose her with autism. Um, it was a level two, level three needs. And they said, and we had in the meantime, also between going to the doctor in April and going to the neurodevelopmental specialist in September had gotten her into OT, PT, and speech therapy. And they recommended also getting her into ABA, getting her into um, more speech because she isn't talking. And it's just, there isn't availabilities. There's no availabilities. Their speech, they could only get us in the one time a week. And then ABA, where we had looked into was a two-year wait list. Wow. And And two years. You're in Ohio, you said? Yes. Okay. So. So your wait list for ABA to, to even start, is that at a clinic or? It is at a, yes, it's at a facility and all they do is focus on children who have autism and okay do ABA. Now, is your early intervention, is that um, in your home? Yes. So we do have early intervention in home and that's really, really helpful for my husband and I. We learn we've learned a lot of like what we can do and how we can do things and get her progressing. But it just, I felt, I feel like it's just not enough for her. So, and that's kind of how I found you in listening to your podcasts. And then I had heard you talk about your book a lot. So I bought that. And then after reading your book decided, all right, I think I'm going to try the class. So also did that. Hey, Shotzi. My dog so is here visiting me. Toddler online course right now. Yes, yes. And you've been there for about a month. Yes. Okay. So we are going to go through your assessments and plans and everything. But uh, I know many of our listeners, you know, have maybe read the book or read 
part of the book. The book is Turn Autism Around, an action guide for parents of young children with early signs of autism. It really does go hand in hand with the toddler course. So some people in the course are saying, well, do I really need the book? And some people with the book are like, is the book enough? So since you're doing both or you did both or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like how do they differ and, and do people need both or how, how would you recommend? I, I mean, I guess it all depends on like how far you want to dive into it. I think that if you want to read the book and go from there, you could, or if you want to take the course and go from there, you could. I like both. I like knowing as much as I can about something. Um, with the course, I do like being able to see the videos and the interactions and the examples. Um, it's, a, it's more detailed, definitely, than the book is, but the book was a great spot to start. And having read the book before taking the course, I was just, I was prepared for it and able to apply it a little bit. Like I just, I knew it was coming next, I guess. Yeah. So. Yeah. definitely. And the other nice thing, and you're, you're a big part of our online community is the community support. So yes, I love that. Uh, you know, just chatting with other parents and early intervention professionals and, you know, yes. stuck and, and that sort of thing. So that's a yeah. big thing that the book alone doesn't do. Yes, I do. I really, really love the online community. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so let's, we're going to make this kind of a hot seat. We've done a few hot seats. This is hot seat number four. Um, our previous hot seats were a podcast 138 with a mom of an early learner. Uh, podcast 134 was um, a a mom of an intermediate learner. And I can't remember what the first hot seat number was. That was kind of like a hot seat that was I wasn't really prepared for. <laughs> so it was a little, it was a little iffy. But I think this hot seat will be great because we're going to talk about, you know, that those really early intervention uh, issues, the, you know, whether you just have the book, because the book explains the one page assessment, the plan, mm -hmm. you can get all the book resources, all these assessments, these plans for free. And you can read chapter one and listen to chapter two on Audible with me reading the book. Um, you can get all those book resources just by going to turnautismaround.com. So that's an excellent place to start. You may even want to go there and download those resources before you continue to listen, because we are literally um, going to go through Lexi, uh, Alyssa's daughter, we're going to go through her assessment and I'm going to go through her language sample. And I'm going to actually um, give some tips that uh, I think will help Alyssa. And I think will help many of you as well. And Alyssa is also very generous in the fact that she's going to share her assessment and her plan and her language sample. And we're going to be able to put those right in the show notes. So those show notes are at marybarbera.com forward slash 167, which is uh, going to be Alyssa's, Alyssa's podcast number. So, um, so Alyssa did the assessment, the one page assessment. Um, she did that at the end of January um, when Lexi was to uh, years, five months old. So she's about two years, six months old at the time of this recording. And uh, for those of you that don't know what the one page assessment is, it's literally just one page. And over a decade ago, I created this um, and it's been revised many times and it's been revised most recently for the book. Um, and we want this to be done as quickly as possible. I say it can take 10 minutes. I don't know, Alyssa, am I, am I way off with that? No, it didn't take long at all. Okay. It, it was an, it was a fast assessment. It was great. Okay. Yeah. And I think it's really good for the professionals out there too. Um, if you start the school year with eight kids or you get a new child into your classroom, or you just want to like get a fresh start because whatever's happening in your classroom is not going the way you want it to go. I would really recommend having the parent and you, the parent really needs to have a heavy part in filling out this form. So even if they can fill out some of it, or you can do it together on zoom or online or in person, um, to get your handle on, you might be like, Oh, Mary, I have, you know, 
eight different assessments on Johnny. We don't, well, the last thing we need is another assessment. No, I think the best thing you can do is a one page assessment because you know, Alyssa, as a special ed teacher, you can have reams of data, but if there's not a, a good place to pull this in, it, it can be really problematic. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, so, um, so she filled out this assessment and I'm just gonna start at the left-hand column. She was diagnosed uh, with ASD. She has no medication, no allergies, no special diet. She is unsafe around traffic and water. She does feed herself, which is gonna become a uh, strength on our plan. Um, she does sleep through the night, another strength on our plan. She's um, not potty trained, but at two and a half, that is really premature. We could talk about that though. Um, and grooming, she needs help, which is not that out of the question. Um, one of the things that I didn't think of until right this second is I know for the other um, hot seats, we did a self-care checklist. Do you, did you happen to do a self-care checklist on Lexi? Yet? I, I had a looked at it. I had not filled it completely out. Um, okay. So that might be something after we record, if you could fill it out and then send it back to us and we'll include that in the show notes too. Okay. But, yeah. But you know, it's very common for a two and a half year old to need help with grooming, dressing, you know, those sorts of things. However, the self-care checklist developed by Dr. Mark Sundberg, which is included in my book and my courses. Um, I really, it's not just included, we use it to guide people. But, you know, if she, for instance, isn't drinking out of an open cup and drinking from a straw in the feeding section, if she is not able to wash her hands with assistance or um, wipe her mouth with a napkin at certain ages, then we can kind of focus on those 18 month skills before we move into the two and three year old skills. So um, that's a good thing we should include. Okay, then we'll get into the speaking expressive language part. She really just had some babbling, although we've made some progress and we're gonna talk about that with the language sample. Um, she at the time a month ago could not request. Um, she would cry and grab instead. And for tacting, if I call out a picture on a page, she will point to it, but cannot echo or say it. So she's having some better receptive language than she is expressive language. Yes, yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So, um, and then she, at the time, was not echoing anything. She wasn't filling in the blanks, doing any intraverbals. But her receptive language, um, she was almost always responding to her name. And sometimes she would follow directions without without gestures. Um, and if you tell her to clap her hands or stand up, she can do it without gestures. Usually um, she can touch her nose uh, as one body part. Imitation is a little iffy, some, some imitation, some matching. And then um, social concerns, circle all that apply. She has problems with greeting, sharing, pretend play. And then problem behaviors, we're at the very end of the one page assessment. So, you know, that didn't even take us five minutes to go over. Um, but the problem behaviors include grabbing, cannot communicate. And then she has trouble with diaper changes. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, she struggles with being laid down on her back. So changing her diaper is... Hi, Shotzi. My dog is very, very into this. Um, <laughs> so she she does struggle when we lay her down on her back. She wants to kick her legs. She screams a little bit. Um, we have been doing a little bit better in that regard. She's very into animals. So uh, my husband discovered, like, if you start talking about animals and animal sounds, she is a little more relaxed. But yeah. Um, and so, even in one month, having done this and you are going through it, I like, she has progressed in a lot of areas. I'm impressed. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, well, let, why don't you tell our, our listeners, what has she progressed in? So some of the things that she's progressed in is she still isn't 
um, dressing herself, but she is starting to want to brush her own teeth. I'll do it first. And then when I'm finished doing it, she'll brush her teeth. So she's been more into that. And then also hand washing. She's become, she actually really likes hand washing now and she enjoys that. Uh, the babbling, she still babbles a lot, but she's really, really trying to mimic sounds. So that's been a huge help. Um, she is, what else did I see? She's starting to do more of the greetings. She's getting more high buy in. It's hard to understand. I can understand it, but um, I'm hearing it, which is exciting she what else did did i see on here i feel like there was another one she's starting to know more body parts as well and when we first started she only knew nose she was really proud of that but now she's getting head she's getting eyes and belly um which yeah. i think has to do with the table time and mr potato head and so. <laughs> mr potato head is yes <laughs> it's actually uh um it's a big part of our program. Um, we do have, and we can put in the show notes, we do have blogs on hand washing, I believe, and greetings. We also have bonus videos. Um, did you see the bonus video yet within the toddler course? I think there's one on greetings in there. Yes, I did. I did. Yeah. And that's what got us into doing some more greeting stuff. So yeah. yeah. So I can put the, the video blogs about greetings and hand washing in the show notes if we have those. Okay. So as I say in the book and in the course is you take the one page assessment um, and you um, go down the left hand column first and the first need we get to is safety awareness. And so for a two and a half year old, it's not that unusual to be unsafe around water and cars, but you know, um, it is something we have to keep them safe. And I've done a lot of work on safety, safety bonus video, a safety podcast, safety chapter of my book. Um, so the first need that Alyssa wrote down is safety around unsafe around water and traffic. Um, but then as I pointed out, as I was reading some of the assessment is the strengths column includes speed self, sleeps through the night, can point to objects in a book if verbalized. Um, and almost always responds to her name, which is great. And now a month later, and I recommend doing this assessment, updating it every three to four months. But if you make really great gains, you can update it even more frequently. Um, you can update the plan more frequently if needed. Um, but usually three or four months is a good time frame to, to reevaluate. And then or your needs are, you know, not potty trained and um, needs help with grooming and dressing, not requesting, cannot sing songs, and consistent with following directions, and consistent with imitation and matching, poor social skills, and uh, the problem behavior. So those are the strengths and needs. And at the bottom, we have a plan, which is just basically work on requesting, manding, tacting, a co imitation and matching. And that may sound like overwhelming, but through the course, through my book, we combine all that into easy activities at the table. So um, can you talk about, you, you have a special ed background too. Is it, is it, I know it's unusual for early intervention practitioners to be focused on the table, but what, what what was your reaction when you started reading that? And what is your reaction now? When we first started table time? Like when you first heard me going, hey, get them to the table and stuff, because yeah, early intervention it, is like all floor and follow the child. It is. It was definitely a, a different approach than what we had been taking prior to it. Um, so I was a little skeptical, but it really, she, we did spend a lot of time just pairing the table and she, she does like it. Like I'm, she, if I say, Lexi, let's go play at the table. She runs to the room where table time is. And we actually now have, we changed the, 
doorknob. We put a lock on it because we would just find her in there like ready. She'd just be sitting at the table, tapping on the table like, okay, I'm ready. So um, wow. That's she, yeah, she loves it. And I wasn't sure if she would go for it or not. She's super squirmy and fidgety. Um, I am too though. So I, I'm okay with that, but she, she does love it. She likes doing puzzles. She loves potato head. She loves it. We have pictures of all of our family that she sees regularly that she puts into the shoe box. She loves that. She's able to match up items that she likes balls, cups. Um, but yeah, she, I wasn't sure if it would go well, but it really, really has. And it's, definitely showing improvements. Yeah. Yeah. So I did do a video blog, I think about table time and why my approach definitely includes table. There's some in my book about why I am big on table time. And I do think it's, it's easier. You have a background, but just say you didn't have a special ed background. It's really easier, easier to train yourself or others at a table I think, because you can get more trials in, especially if the child likes the table, then it's easier to transfer those skills to other people. Yes, definitely. Um, she, I do notice that when I would follow her around, it was hard to keep her interest in something. And she is a child who, if there's a lot of objects like her stem is to just like gather up all of those objects and then hold them. And then it's just kind of like, all right, well, now I can't get you to do anything at all because you're just holding all of these pieces. And so getting her to do things for me outside of a station spot was really hard. And with table time, I'm, I'm the one in control of the pieces. So, um, Right. Definitely uh, helps. At the same time, she's running to the table. She's happy. Yeah. She wants to do it. And that, you know, table time that doesn't look like that. I mean, you don't have to be that enthusiastic about table time, but you definitely want the child to want to do it. And if they're not wanting to do it, it is, it's not your fault, but you don't have the reinforcement, right? The demands are too high. The reinforcement's too low. And there's never a time when you can't repair anything, pair up, repair. So, um, and don't just get like, well, I'm going to let them stand at the table or we'll just do it in the high chair or we'll just have to do it on the floor because um, if they're not running to the table, they're not going to be running to the toilet to potty train. They're not going to be running to the bathtub to learn how to get a shower. They're not going to be running to get a haircut. Um, all of these things are hard and and potentially hard for kids yes. and um we're not we're we're wanting them to really want to be with us to want to learn to want to accept reinforcement and so it's it's not a control thing it's just this is the most expedited way i know how to get children to increase talking and decrease problem behaviors and that's the way we can work on requesting, tacting, echo, exhibition, matching, all at the same time is through these early learner programs like the, the shoe box and potato head, et cetera. So also you're gonna use uh, or have been using the one word times three strategy. Um, why don't you tell our listeners, I'm sure some of them have heard of that. <laughs> yes. So, we will, when I'm doing things with her, I'll show her a picture of mommy and I'll hold it up and tell her mommy, mommy, mommy. And then she'll take my picture and she'll insert it in the shoe box. And we, I do it all day long. I, I find myself saying things three times, even with my students at work now. And it's, it, I do feel like it's definitely paying off and it's so easy to just implement. You just, whatever we're doing with her, we just say it three times when it's time to eat. Lexi, let's eat, eat. And she comes running to the table to eat now. And so. Yeah. And she's starting to even echo sometimes. Yes. If, if she does echo, I just want to point out if, if the child does echo, if you say eat 
And she says, eat. You don't say it three times. You just say it that once. And then you make a big deal out of that. So um, yeah, so one word up to three times. And then you also said you are using the shush and give uh, technique throughout the day. Can you tell our, our, our listeners about that? Yes, I do have a harder time with that one. Yeah. Um, she, I'll tell her shh and then give it to her. And I'm never quite sure because she doesn't always stop the fussing. So I don't know like, okay, well, she's still crying. Do I still give it or so that would be something great for you to help me out with. Okay. Okay. So the shush and give is um, when a child is whining, crying, having problem behaviors, and they want something, but you can't just give it to them. So say the child is wanting water and saying, water, water, grabbing. And, you know, it's important to get the child quiet at least for a couple seconds before you deliver the water. So um, this is a very, uh, very simple kind of count mand procedure for those professionals out there that know what a count mand is. So Dr. Cor Vincent Carbon came up with the strategy and it used to be like, okay, now you have to be quiet. You have to be quiet for a count of 10. And you can imagine how much tantruming goes on with trying to get a child to quiet down for yes. a full 10 <laughs> seconds and out loud count. It was just like, this is not working, especially for little kids, but even for older kids, um, if they have language delays, you want to get them the reinforcement, but you want to get it when they're quiet. So, so say she's like, oh, 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 and you know, what you just said is like, it's hard to know when to give it to her. And I often describe this as like a jump rope, like you got to make a decision. And sometimes it's wrong. <laughs> sometimes you go in and you're like, oh my gosh, you just let out a yelp in between me saying shush and giving it. And now she just got reinforced, but quiet down as much as possible. Shh, you know, even if it goes from a cry to like a whimper shh, okay. and it doesn't have to be like within 10 seconds or 30 seconds or a minute, you could just, you know, put the water aside gently. Let's calm down. Let's take some deep breaths. Like good, good, good. Okay. Now let's have some water. So it doesn't have to be this whole, like, um, we want to be gentle. We want to be, you know, help the child calm down. And if they are wanting something that they can't have, so that that's a struggle too. So say they want, um, you know, a French fry from another, another person at a restaurant from their plate and they can't have that and the, their food's not ready. You know, you can't do a shush and give them that fry. So it's, it's more of an accepting no kind of thing, but you can do the same kind of gentle techniques. Let's quiet down. Shh. Shh. Okay. Let's take some deep breaths and uh, deep breaths are actually good. Um, uh, you know, let's, let's calm your hands down. Let's, let's like, um, squeeze your hands together. Let's, and then I like, can't have the fry from the neighbor's table, but okay. I have my iPhone or I have a cracker that I keep in my bag or here, let's have some crayons. But the important thing about a shush and give or calm down procedure, or, you know, um, that sort of thing is that we don't want to give the child an item during crying um, or whining or whatever, because that's going to increase it. So I, I think what you're describing is kind of more that jump rope, like you're not quite sure if you're doing it right. But over time, you don't have to worry about the yelp or, oh, that I reinforced a little early or late, um, because over time, you're just going to want to get her happier and happier. Yes. Yes. That's a good to know. Cause I think you're right with the description of the jump rope. Like I, I am always just like, Oh, when do I jump in? When do I give it to her? Yeah. And when you're using a shush and give, remember it's a reactive strategy. Okay. So we want to spend 95% of our time preventing problem behaviors. So even if you have a nightmare situation at the restaurant with the neighbor's French fry, um, you're going to be the Monday morning quarterback. Next time you go to a restaurant, you're going to have snacks. You're going to have crayons. You're going to have whatever. 
and you're going to prevent that problem behavior next time. So even if you're using the shush and give and it doesn't go well, think about how you can prevent next time. Yes. Okay, so then um, ABC or calendar data on problem behaviors. Uh, I did do a video blog we can include in the show notes here, 167, um, on calendar data. Are you taking calendar data now? So I haven't done calendar, but I have done the ABC, and it's usually a lot of the problem behaviors we were seeing were stemming from her having items that she wasn't supposed to have and then getting her to give up those items. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, a lot of the time, if we just ignored her within about two minutes, she's over it and moves on. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. it's one of those things, like I didn't realize that prior to doing that, that that's what was causing some of it, so. Yeah, I think ABC data definitely helps. And again, if you're doing ABC data, and you're looking at crying and other problem behaviors, then um, you're looking at reactive. So taking ABC data or calendar data helps you think about how can I prevent this next time? Um, how can I be more uh, proactive and preventative? And then the last thing you have on the plan is pair sitting on potty one time per day. And one of the things I would say is, um, you know, when you described her having problem behaviors laying on her back for pot for diaper changes, I'm assuming she lays on her back to sleep without a problem. She is actually a stomach sleeper. Okay. She, she always has been. She just, she's usually sitting up looking at a book and then she just like folds right in half. She almost sits sitting like Indian style and then she'll eventually in the middle of the night wiggle to her tummy. Okay. And then the other question I would have is she's not constipated, is she? She is not. Okay. She is not. Okay. Because I just did a podcast interview with um, a potty training guru, uh, Dr. Stephen Hodges, who, you know, really said like peeing and pooping and, you know, kind of getting in weird positions could be a sign of constipation. But um one, a couple things, diaper changes, I would, I would be preventative. And like your husband kind of discovered the whole, if you talk to her about animals or whatever, if she could hold something um, while she's laying on her back, that's super fun. Um, if she could get a special treat for, you know, doing a diaper change, um, something that she really loves that she doesn't get a lot. If you could pair that up so that it was, you uh, more doable. And I would, I mean, she's two and a half. Um, will she sit on the potty? She will. She's, she's a funny little girl. She likes chairs. So she, when she does sit on the, like, I've only done it with her a couple of times, night times get crazy. So, and I, I don't feel like there's a lot of potty training readiness there yet. So I've only done it a couple of times and both times she thought it was silly. And then she would just straighten her legs and straighten her back and then just kind of like push herself off. So I've kind of held back on that a little bit more recently. Okay. So I would, um, you know, I wouldn't wait too long to, to pair up uh, the potty or the toilet, like maybe diaper changes. If she has a bowel movement, maybe show her empty it in the in the regular toilet maybe get a, a seat for the regular toilet um and you know they have contraptions where the seat and the little stairs you know she could really like like that or just a little uh fisher price potty that she could sit on i would do it more not less like i wouldn't do it once a night even then or i would do it like three times a day like this is potty time, this is practice, but um, I wouldn't wait for like potty signs. I wouldn't do anything intensive, but I think yeah. the better she can get at just sitting and, and maybe she'll pee. Um, I always like to do it first thing in the morning because that's the highest probability time that she has to pee. So I even made up a song with Lucas, like first time, first thing in the morning, when you wake up, you go pee pee on the body. Um, and it's from like Wiggles or something. But um, 
but that became part of our routine. So morning, night, before you go on a trip, before she goes to school, whatever. Um, but you don't want her squirming and, you know, so you're going to have to think yeah, about yeah. strong reinforcement, maybe a special potty seat, maybe uh, would, would kind of. Yeah. And we even have in the basement from our other daughter, her little tiny potty. And as much as Lexi loves little chairs, I'm surprised that I haven't thought to bring that up and get it cleaned off and ready. So that's okay. definitely something that I will do. Yeah, I think a mistake people make is like only getting the potty chair or potty seat out when they're three, when they're like, okay, it's time, you know, get it out sooner um, and pair it up. And I also have, you know, a potty chapter in my book, a potty uh, podcast, a couple of potty podcasts we can link in the show notes. Okay, so um, the other thing you wrote down here in the corner of your plan is, uh, reinforcement will smile and be happy when she gets it a duck a book and mom yeah. m&ms oh m&m okay yeah sorry okay i'm so, not that special <laughs> but, I was say, mom. okay so those are kind of clues okay and let's just talk about your language sample quickly and we're going to post this in the show notes too um, hopefully this is helpful for everybody but i i do want to get to a couple tips that i saw just Part of it was those uh, reinforcement of duck, book, and M&M, &M, and part of it is from her language sample. Um, on 119 and 120, she really just had a couple um, uh, ha or gaga, gigi, you know, the kind of just sounds and, and um, high-pitched laugh and a pretend cough, which is good, a lip smack, which is good. Um, with one of my little clients, um, Jacob, who's in the course, he, when I got there, uh, the family had kind of taught him to go, blah, 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 take his finger and make his lips go funny. And <clears throat> even though that's not usually the imitation we start with, um, it was an imitative skill that we could get under our control pretty quickly. So um, that fake cough and lip smacking might be things that you can get her to do on saying, go like this, you know, or go like this. <coughs> and um, even those two things are kind of like uh oral mode. They're definitely oral motor imitation, but they're, they're getting to echoics as well. Um, and then, so on two nine, you did another language sample and these language samples are 10 minutes, 20 minutes, doesn't matter. Whatever you do, just pick the time, set the timer and be there for any kind of words. So she said, K for cup, P for pizza, both looking at pictures. Ba -ba. Yeah, that was during the table time. That's my okay. shorthand. My TT is my table time. Okay, great. And then Baba, when she saw a picture of a sheep, Mama, um, during table time and lots of babbling in between. And then you say, in three weeks, I went from just tracking sounds to tracking echoics, which is amazing. Um, I would keep a language sample like once a week. At a yeah. Minute. I don't know if you're okay. But, you know, I think it's for some kids, we, we keep it every day. We, we tally and we, you know, write down every new word we hear, every word we hear, you can get a, um, you know, it's probably going to be time for you to get a clicker like this and keep track of words heard during table time. And then you can say, okay, in 15 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour, we got five words. And so whatever you measure will increase like so um and it sounds like the floodgates are just about ready to open here I yeah I feel like they are it's it's coming it's and it's coming fast I'm excited about it yeah so um a couple things I saw now there's four steps to the turn autism around approach assessment which we just went over the one page assessment and the language sample and you're going to send us a self care assessment those are the big the big ones to start with um the plan we just went over and now the third step of the turn autism around approach is intervention or teaching and I just want to talk to you just a couple things that I saw that were clues in the assessment 
that might help with the teaching. You already said she loves the table. She loves the early learner materials, which is just amazing, right? So, um, okay. So the shoe box, I would, if you don't have it, I would, I would gather pictures of, actually I would get double pictures because we can always use these for matching too, of pizza, um, cup, uh, mama, M&M, &M, um, sheep, and we can call the sheep Baba just because we normally we'd want to call the sheep sheep, but since she's echoing or she's saying Baba, we can, the goal here really is to get a coex because once you get a coex and she starts saying everything you're saying, then the floodgates are open. Yep. So um, also with a puzzle, make sure you have an animal puzzle that has both a sheep and a duck. Um, also, which I don't think I've ever given this, this guidance before in the course or in any podcast, but you can also get another container like an oatmeal container or a shoe box or something with a lid and make that the 3D shoe box. So you can have 3D figurines like farm animals, Ooh. like a sheep and a duck. And you can have food, fake food, like a little pizza, a little dollhouse cup. That's a great idea. I yeah. like that. <laughs> You're taking notes. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I totally am. <laughs> no, you totally should. Um, and I, you know, and that can just be like the special other shoe box, you know, that's the other that's, um, you know, and I do like the idea of like having like an oatmeal container or something where, you know, it's a bigger, bigger slit. It's a different thing, but it's important for to get kids to label objects and not just pictures too. So that goes hand in hand. You can also then take your pictures and your little 3D items and you can do 3D to yeah. 2D matching. That's a, yes, I like that idea. <laughs> Lexi's not going to know what hit her. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you're right. Oh, new materials. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Let's see what else I have here. Um, I already talked to you about the imitation, like the, the sounds, the popping sound or the, um, the coughing, the fake coughing. You can, I would totally mix those in with clapping, patting on the table, doing those easy imitation skills too. And if she stops like responding to popping or coughing that's not something you can make like you can't physically help her do so you know as long as she's doing it but if you're like do this <coughs> and it takes you like 10 times till she does it then stop doing it because we don't want to give kids directions that they can't easily follow and we have no way to prompt them that's why i'm not a big proponent on sitting kids down and trying to do a coex no we're going to go in the back door we're going to get them excited about labeling the nose and the and for a potato head and labeling the sheep for the puzzle i right, we're we're going to get them just excited about being there and listening. And then we're gonna get them excited about actually trying to say it, um, but it's gonna be on their terms and when they're ready. And once the floodgates yeah. open, it's gonna be fun for her to talk more. Yes. Okay. And um, I already gave you the ideas about the problem behaviors, the diaper change. And then, um, so that's all teaching and intervention. Do you have any questions? Um, we're gonna get to the fourth step of the Turn Autism Around approach, which is data collection, but do you have any questions while we're at the teaching? So, yeah, I do. We have another daughter who's four years old. She's gonna be five soon. And I know that she's really into helping Lexi. And if you had any suggestions on how to kind of get her engaged into the teaching process or, I don't really know how to incorporate her, but I know that there's got to be a way. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so in the verbal behavior bundle, which you'll hopefully go to next. So people start out with the toddler. And then if you have an older child uh, or you're professional working with older children, you just start out at the verbal behavior bundle. But in that course, 
we do have videos of Jacob, which I talked about with the with the lip and the finger movement. Um, his older brother was Scotty. He was he was just two years older, like like your daughters are mm -hmm. uh, two years apart in age, and he was about the same age. So Jacob was two and three, and and Scotty was four and five. And I went there weekly um, for a while, years actually. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so when Scotty was there, um, they were being watched by their grandmother and we would do practice circle time with the therapist and the grandma. And so they'd read the book and they'd ask Scotty to do a couple of, the, oh, what's, what color is this? And that sort of thing for him. And then they'd say, touch the sheep. And they pull it over for, you know, your daughter to, to respond to. So you get active responding for both of them. We also would have, we trained Scotty and I think there might be a, um, a video in the verbal behavior bundle where we, we literally sat next to Scotty. He held up the, the sheep or he held up the banana and said, banana, banana, banana. Um, and she could, you know, she could learn how to do those things. I wouldn't yeah. have them do it on their own, but you sitting <laughs> next to her, she can become like a little junior therapist. Um, and some people might think, well, oh, that's, yeah, she's only four or five. Why put this on her? No, this is just active engagement. You know, like little kids like to play teacher. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so she can be your little junior teacher, right? Yes. And, um, yeah, I think, I think Scotty, I think they even got him a shirt that said junior therapist or something. Oh, um, yeah. And he was, he was always really proud of it. And I know with, um, with my kids, with Spencer, he was 18 months younger, but by the time Lucas started therapy and, you know, um, Spencer was four and Lucas was five and a half, but Spencer was very much like, look at the moon and you know he'd keep an eye on on um on lucas if we were out he would you know he still does um and it i don't know if you've listened to the podcast with spencer my my typically developing son but it's a great podcast and um you know kids with siblings on the spectrum are very special and many times just so resilient and so exceptional that um so i think those are are good things to make she could model sitting on the potty um she could model laying on her back you know for a diaper change or she could lay with her um and then yeah that's good idea. it's her diaper change and they both get reinforcement so yeah use that use her for modeling for um activity. I also have a video in the verbal behavior bundle with um, Jenna, with her kids, Cody and Ava. And Ava was two years younger. And so Cody was four and Ava was two and Ava uh, was not on the spectrum. So, she, but she would have them both at the table just to kind of keep them both busy. Um, okay. So does That's that a but yeah, that does. And I think that she would really enjoy getting to be a part of table time too, because when I'm in there with Lexi, she'll kind of crack the door and peek in. She wants to know what's going on. She always has some reason that she needs something. She needs to ask something because I think that she just wants to like, what are you guys doing? Yeah. She sees so. her getting your undivided attention. Yes. And maybe you need to have just like, okay, we're going to set a timer. You know, this is, this is Lexi and your other daughter's name time. Like, okay, when the timer rings, then you're going to go into the other room and you're going to do X, Y, and Z, which is fun. Um, but, you know, maybe set, set a timer for some limits so that you can just try it out without it impeding of the whole lesson. Yes. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any other questions about that step? I think that that was my biggest one there. Okay. Um, did you also have, like, do you have extended family that you also want to? Yes. Oh, yes, definitely. So we actually live um, across the street from my brother's, not my brother's, my husband's sister and her family. And then also across the street and down just a little bit is 
my mother and father-in-law. So everyone just has a hand in Lexi's uh, progress and what we're doing. So I didn't know if there were ways to kind of incorporate them or things to let them know to keep things, just yeah. any advice that you have on that. Yeah. I mean, if they would be willing to read my book or have you just explain to them, I mean, you could even do a video and you could just say, this is what we're doing. Here's a little table time. Here's the early learner materials. You know, if Lexi cries and whines, you know, we don't want to give her things right that second. We want to try to calm her down. We want to spend 95% of our time preventing, you know, show them if they're around and you are going to do table time, you know, show them, um, show them how you say a word three times and you're, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think just keeping them in the loop and educating yeah. them um, might be good. They can listen to this, watch this podcast yes. and get, you know, just some tips. Yeah. They are excited that I'm doing a podcast with you. And my mother-in-law actually has read your book. I shared mine with her when I was done with it. And she is excited to come and see what table time looks like and uh, yeah. jump in and help out. We have so many grandmothers within our course. Um, I did a podcast with grandma Diane a couple of years ago, and it is one of my absolute favorites. So we can link that in the yes. show notes, but, um, grandmothers, uh, mo most of the time it's grandmothers. There's a few been, a few have been grandfathers or we've had aunts and, um, we've had, you know, certainly parents and guardians. So, um, the more people you can get to do yes. this, to expand the better. Um, let's talk, um, quickly about just the last step is, is data collection. I would say, keep going with the ABC data. If, when you have big problem behaviors, and then also, um, the calendar system might be helpful Oops, in terms of just, um, keeping track of anything major, but, you know, I think it seems like things are really going well now. You had said there's a two-year wait list for ABA. Are you are you going to be able to get ABA? Or are you going to just how are, what what's going to happen? So there were a couple of there's a couple ABA options around here. So the one that would be the um, it would it would essentially be like her full time school, which is the ABA that has the two year wait list, and we've gone. Um, she really, really gets a lot from social interaction with peers. So because it's all children who are on the spectrum, I just, I don't know what the right thing to do is. And then also knowing it's a two-year wait list, I just don't know. Um, and then there's another ABA facility near us and I, I'm skeptical about it. Mm -hmm. And then I was, there's a third option. And when I called to try to get Lexi on the wait list for them, they said that because we're currently getting EI services that we wouldn't, we can't double dip into the county's disabilities okay. assistance They're and funding. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that one would have been a free resource, but working in special education and knowing that there is a BCBA at our school that works for that third option, which I was told I couldn't have because of EI. I was like, I'm just going to ask her like, what, what's the deal with that? And so I actually recently spoke with her about it. And she said that they can offer if you have the right insurance, um, they can offer you like in their facility some help. So she, I did get her into that. I don't know what it's going to look like yet. She has her intake on Thursday. So I'm excited to see how that goes. I just know that I feel like I need to be doing more. And she's right now just, she, I can tell that she's just ready. And so I just, I'm desperate for resources. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, and, and, you know, 
I think a lot of people get to your point to to this point where you know you are seeing gains and one of the big things that I warn people no matter what services you're looking at if you're looking at ABA or if you're looking at speech or OT or whatever is that I have a very different system I have a very different approach and you know one one example one mom had um was making all kinds of gains kind of at this point child was starting to talk was happy with the table loved it and she got to the front of the line for this aba to be in the home and they came and they were like we're gonna you know take him in his bedroom shut the door you're gonna hear a lot of crying mm-hmm. um that's not you know <laughs> and you as a special ed background you know that you're not going to you know uh do that you know no, and yes but but this this family did kind of just deal with it and I, I don't know how you know what their circumstances were or maybe it was just bad in the very very beginning but still we don't want kids to have any trauma any crying and if people if you the parent have found a way whatever you call it xyz method yeah. That is working, that the child is running to the table and learning and starting to echo, you know, that needs to keep going. And that whole philosophy needs to keep going. So um, it sounds like you're in the right direction. Your, your eyes are wide open, but yes. Um, and the other thing is I did do a video blog on how to pick ABA an ABA school home versus school ABA, which I think is important, but um. Uh, we also did a recent podcast with Michelle C and her daughter, Elena, and we did a case study white paper that we can link in the show notes. And, um, you know, her daughter was similar. She liked the social, she didn't like the social, but the, the mom wanted, really wanted her to socialize and everything. Um, and she got very social when she went to an ABA school, but eventually she became too like conversational and she really didn't need it. So she was discharged and now she's in typically, typically developing school. But I know for Lucas, he always went to typical preschool and that can have really good effects with good role modeling. And so, you know, I think with your background and with the courses, you could come up with a home program um, or or a clinic program, but that would involve some part-time uh, preschool that is with typically developing peers. Yeah. Um, at least at some point. Yes. So- yeah. Oh, I, I guess we'll see what happens on Thursday, but I am going to, I'm, I'm hopeful that all goes well. I'm hopeful that their approach is similar to yours and that it stays positive and keeps her excited. I mean, she's, she's a happy little girl. So yeah, I'm, if anything starts to show red flags of a displeased towards it, I'm not going to be afraid to pull her. So yeah. Well, it sounds like you're doing great. Um, We are going to wrap it up. But before I let you go, I always like to end this way. Part of my podcast goals are really not to just help the kids, but also help the parents and professionals listening to be less stressed and lead happier lives. So do you have any self-care tips or stress reduction tools that you use that you'd recommend? Yes, listening to your podcast, I I was ready for that one. <laughs> it's, uh, so at nighttime, when my husband and I get our girls into bed, a couple nights a week, we just like to come back downstairs and have a glass of wine together and just have time together without hecticness and interruptions from children. So that's kind of our unwind time together and us getting to communicate and just child free time. <laughs> Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Love that. So thank you so much. I think this um, hot seat was, is going to be very beneficial to our listeners. Hopefully it was helpful to you. I know I loved yes. hearing the story and 
Um, I'm excited for the progress that Lexi's going to continue to make. So hang in there, uh, keep us posted within our online community and um, good luck to you. Yes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I feel honored that I got to sit with you. (laughs) 